This episode is dedicated to Wesley Duggle, Glenn 108, Zachary Perez, and Cinnamon for becoming our newest Southpaw supporters and helping to make this project possible. The Southpaw project is supported entirely by listeners like you. If you want to support the work that we do, please leave us a five star review wherever you listen. Share these episodes, follow us on social media. If you're a new listener, make sure to click subscribe. And if you really want to support this project, then become a paid monthly subscriber on patreon.com slash southpawpod. If you head over to Patreon and subscribe for just $4 a month, you will get immediate access to our complete catalog of bonus episodes, videos, and articles. The more supporters we have, the more time we can dedicate to the show, which means more bonuses. And most important of all, hire and pay for staff. If you can't support us monthly, you can also do one-time donations at co-fi.com slash southpawpod. We also have t-shirts and sweatshirts to not only flex the show, but your own moral compass. By supporting us, you're not only helping us grow, you're also helping us stay and keep this project running. We can't exist without your support. Thank you. This is Sam. And this is Southpaw. This checklist for fascistic personalities and cults was originally released as a bonus episode in 2019. It was re-released in 2020, due to the rise of QAnon, conspiracy cults, and organized white supremacy. We're releasing it again as a regular episode, in light of the sexual abuse problems in martial arts. This episode, unfortunately, is becoming a perennial resource. Please continue to share it with others. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about community. In my early years of martial arts, what probably mattered most was what would beat what in a head-on, one-on-one fight. And that's probably why now I think so much about community, because that obsession with what is, quote-unquote, the best, can lead to toxic environments and a breakdown of community. The quote-unquote strongest calls all the shots. I've not only lived through watching training environments I love turn to dumpster fires, but it is also the most common question I get. If someone were to ask me what are the top five most common questions I get, I'd say I don't get five. I get countless variations of one question. How do I find a positive training environment? Either they've been burned in the past, or they watch their current training environment fall apart, or trusted a teacher who turned out to be abusive. Regardless of gender, regardless of politics, this is the question I get. More than what works in a fight, community is what's on people's minds. It might not get them in the door, but it's what makes them stay, and it's what they're looking for in their next school. Which got me wondering, what are the things to watch out for when considering authoritarian types and people who seek authoritarian rule? What are the telltale signs we so often miss? And philosopher Theodore W. Adorno had already thought about this in the 1940s and created a test, which he called the F scale or the fascist test. It's not meant to test the government or your politics, but instead your personality. 30 statements to see if you tend to be problematic. Now, any of these symptoms in isolation is fine and can even be healthy and positive. But when you have too many symptoms is when you have a disease. Like cleanliness by itself is not a problem, but that along with several other symptoms can mean an obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, I want you to think about each statement and why it might be harmful. Think about what each statement says about an individual's personality. Are you already hearing these statements from people around you? Do you notice the people you can't get along with always say statements like these? Question the promotion of these statements. Question the promotion of these ideas. Why they are often lauded. 
what culture is it trying to create? And if this already represents the culture around you. If you notice these traits from people around you, you won't be surprised when they say or do things that are deeply offensive because they're staying consistent to their worldview. There is this idea from Taoism and martial arts. How a person is in one situation is how they are in all situations, if you can look critically enough. So the test is testing how much you agree with each statement. Do you find these statements troubling or do you find them to be ideal? Is the handmaid's tale terrifying or a utopia? And to many, it is their utopia, or at least they don't see the horror in it. They're probably like, what's the big deal? People are overreacting. And you hear that a lot today, don't you? Though this was written in the 40s, you might think it was written this year because personality types are timeless. So in thinking about these statements, don't only think about politicians. Think about your own community. Think about yourself. Think about your mate, your friends, your parents, your classmates, your training partners, your teachers, your gym mates, your allies, your leaders, and so forth. I know if I had found this test years ago, it would have saved me a lot of abuse and pain. Statement one, obedience and respect for authority are the most important virtues children should learn. This statement invokes two types of fascist personality traits. Conventionalism, which is a rigid adherence to conventional values, and secondly, authoritarian submission, a submissive, uncritical attitude toward idealized moral authorities of the in-group. So, I can't question tradition, and I can't question the moral authority of people I admire. So if these traditions and people I admire happen to be perfect, then I lucked out. It's all gravy. But if they happen to be flawed, then I'm screwed because I'm not going to question it or try to change it anyway. Statement two, a person who has bad manners, habits, and breeding can hardly expect to get along with decent people. This statement invokes two personality traits, conventionalism, just like the first statement, and also authoritarian aggression, a tendency to be on the lookout for and to condemn, reject, and punish people who violate conventional values. This is about indignation and moral superiority. This is about hurting people. You won't get mad when, let's say, a person of color is discriminated against, but if someone doesn't say thank you when you hold the door for them or say you're welcome when you say thank you, you lose your shit. Because discrimination is about justice, which fascists don't care about. They care about tradition. And they care about it with the volume knob all the way up. There's also elitism and racism mixed into this as well. I'm better than you not only because of how I act, but also by birthright, by predeterminism, and now by genetics. And this is why tradition or convention is important, because there's no way to prove what's been predetermined so you fall back on, well, that's how it's always been. You hear that, don't you? When you're pointing out something that's really troubling or bad, somebody will say, well, that's how it's always been. Like, what the fuck does that mean? How does that help the current situation? How does that solve any problems? And that's the point, to maintain the problems that already exist. Statement three, if people would talk less and work more, everybody would be better off. Now, as I previously stated, it's not about any one statement by itself, but the general pattern, and also how strongly you agree with each statement. There is good to working more and talking less. Even listening to authority can save your ass, but how rigid you are and how strongly you feel about it, that's what we're looking at here. This particular statement invokes conventionalism, authoritarian aggression, and anti-interception, which is the opposition to the subjective, the imaginative, or the tender-minded, basically being kind, decent, and empathetic. So this type of person believes too much thinking is bad, too much learning is bad, too much imagination is bad, and being kind-hearted is stupid and bad. It's the mean dad morals. What would a mean dad say in this situation? That's where I'll draw my morals from. 
help people, a mean dad would say, fuck them. Let them learn on their own. Stop complaining and just work with the system that exists because tradition and legacy are always fair. This isn't true, of course, which is why tradition acts as the ultimate proof for itself. If it weren't fair, it wouldn't be a tradition, except you're not allowed to change tradition anyway. Basically change nothing. It's the end of history. Progress is over. Just maintain the status quo. And if it's bad, that's your fault, not the system's. But with just three statements, this already sounds like people you know, doesn't it? Maybe you hear these things all the time. And what you'll find is, if you know someone who says one of these statements, they'll usually also say some of the other statements. Because it's not about each individual statement, but a personality trait. And if you happen to have that trait, you'll stay consistent to it. Statement four, the businessman and the manufacturer are much more important to society than the artist and the professor. Conventionalism and anti-interception. You can't allow empathy or imagination if you want to maintain the system. And also this idea believes that wealth makes you more important rather than merit. So rather than evidence-based, it's based on feelings and a supernatural belief in hierarchies. Statement five, science has its place, but there are many important things that can never be understood by the human mind. This is the authoritarian submission and superstition and stereotypy, the belief in mystical determinants of the individual's fate and the disposition to think in rigid categories. Some things are right even if science says otherwise. And if it's overly complicated, it can't be true. It has to be simple and black and white. And authority says this is the right way, and so it must be. We have to keep doing things, even if it's contrary to the evidence, because of authority and tradition, which usurps evidence. Things are correct because of a higher force we cannot understand. Call it God or natural law or nature or what have you. So now you're starting to see how one personality trait can reinforce other personality traits and how if you only have one of these traits, it might be fine. But if you have three of them, then you have a problem. Also, how strongly you believe in these ideas. Fascists are absolutists. Statement six. Every person should have complete faith in some supernatural power whose decisions he obeys without question. Authoritarian submission, superstition, and stereotypy. Believing in a higher power is fine, but the problem that arises in real life is hero worship or this belief that a person you admire or look up to can do no wrong. Then they become godlike in your eyes. And if you believe you're better than everyone else, you might believe yourself to be godlike. You're always and absolutely right. The authority you appeal to is always and absolutely right. Faith means in spite of evidence. So if your supernatural power wants to hurt everybody else, I guess to you, you just have to do what you got to do. And I guess the rest of us are fucked. Statement seven. Young people sometimes get rebellious ideas, but as they grow up, they ought to get over them and settle down. This is classic authoritarian submission. We'll create the world, and eventually you need to fall in line and maintain what we've created. But that's the problem with blindly following something. It becomes a runaway train. No one remembers or knows why it's headed where it is, and no one is allowed to question where it's going because it's been going that way before you were even born. Even if that means the place where it's headed is bad, like the end of life on planet Earth. Statement 8. What this country needs most more than laws and political programs, is a few courageous, tireless, devoted leaders in whom the people can put their faith. This is authoritarian submission and power toughness. Power toughness is the personality trait in which you have a preoccupation with the dominant submission, strong, weak, leader, follower, dimensions, identifying with power figures, and overemphasizing the conventionalized attributes of the ego like exaggerated assertions of strength and toughness, the alpha male, or being quote-unquote alpha in general. So basically, put some strong people in charge and they'll straighten everything out. If they couldn't, why would they be born strong? 
And if they're strong, they'll be the ones to figure it out. It's circular reasoning. A lot of this is circular reasoning. And as I previously mentioned, a lot of this also hinges on black and white thinking rather than being able to think in a scale or spectrum. There's no plurality, just is or isn't, yes or no, strong or weak. And so black and white thinking needs very obvious traits. It can't handle investigation or research. It's all gut reaction. Statement nine, no sane, normal, decent person could ever think of hurting a close friend or relative. Authoritarian submission. Anything bad that happens is an aberration. It doesn't imply a problem with the system. Also, it assumes normal, decent, sane people could never do anything bad. It's not that we're all possible of doing harm by just simply following orders. But people who blindly follow orders will do bad things if they blindly follow orders that harm others. It also assumes that doing something bad automatically makes you a bad person, that people can't just fuck up or make a mistake or that they can't be redeemed. So there's a punitive aspect of this where those are just the bad eggs. And what do you do with bad eggs? Well, you get rid of them. Statement 10. Nobody ever learned anything really important except through suffering. Authoritarian submission. It's that mean dad thing again. Suffering is good. Allowing people to suffer is good. It promotes education. Then all suffering exists for a reason, and all suffering is good. They're suffering for their own good. That's the misguided logic to this thinking. Statement 11. What the youth needs most is strict discipline, rugged determination, and the will to work and fight for family and country. Authoritarian aggression and power toughness. Do whatever you need to. Sacrifice and suffer, not for justice, but out of loyalty. And above all else, don't question why you're doing it. This is why discipline and determination are important. To make you complete a task without knowing why. The runaway train again. Statement 12. An insult to our honor should always be punished. Authoritarian submission and power toughness. It's about pride and power and being unchallenged. Any challenge must be punished. Control must be absolute. And also, what's considered insulting to your honor is very emotional and broad. So now you cast a wide net to hurt people. Sometimes somebody just existing can be an insult to your honor. That's why in the past, Sometimes people got killed if you just looked at them, or if you did something in private that didn't affect anybody else and only affected you, that could still be considered an insult to somebody's honor. So it can be a tool to be cruel and sociopathic. Statement 13. Sex crimes such as rape and attacks on children deserve more than mere punishment. Such criminals ought to be publicly whipped or worse. Authoritarian aggression and anti-degeneracy or sex obsession. It's the exaggerated concern with sexual goings-on of others and resistance to sexual degeneracy within one's group. This statement is tough, and if this were the only one you felt strongly about, you would still be considered normal and far from a fascist. So why is this in here then? Because it's this in combination with other beliefs. It's like this normal, everyday type of fascism that we don't notice. Because this statement also speaks to the belief that anything involving sex requires special punishment, and special as in worse punishment. It also highlights the paranoia about sex crimes, in particular with children. Conspiracy theories about child sex rings aren't new. One of the fears the KKK conjured up against African Americans were that they intended to rape white women and children. The same thing happened to the Jews. You want to get a lynch mob? Accuse someone of being a pedophile. It's like dynamite. And authoritarians know this can trigger action in people, and they want to manipulate this rage. Authoritarians want to push buttons to get automatic reactions. But this is where the emphasis on the punitive aspect is important in this statement. If it just triggers people to get mad, and want someone to stand trial, well, that's not really fascist. Wanting to kill someone or take justice into your own hands or wanting some kind of special punishment for them, 
That's the part Adorno was trying to get at. Statement 14. There is hardly anything lower than a person who does not feel a great love, gratitude, and respect for his parents. Authoritarian aggression. Like the overemphasis on sex, there is an overemphasis on loyalty to your parents, to your tradition, to your country, religion, or heritage. It's also a test of intensity. You can't just show a little love, a little gratitude, or even a good amount of respect and loyalty. It has to be great and unwavering, or it's just as bad as someone who intentionally disrespects and spits on those same values. Loyalty must be cult and absolute. Nothing less is acceptable. This is why black and white thinking is a crucial trait for fascism. Statement 15. Most of our social problems would be solved if we could somehow get rid of the immoral, crooked, and the feeble-minded. This is authoritarian aggression. Who gets to decide what is immoral or crooked? Who are the feeble-minded? Again, these are just justifications to be fascist or cruel. And also, it's never the system's fault. It's the weakness of the individual. The system must remain intact, but get rid of the people making the system look bad. This is why the high punitive and aggressive aspect is important to fascism. Strong punishment does not allow for mistakes. So let's say you whip someone or you kill them. If later you find out you're wrong, you can't undo that punishment. Harsh punishments are fascist because harsh punishments are absolute and does not allow room for being wrong. And also, it's not about restoring people back into society, but about vengeance. And if all that matters is the punishment, finding out the truth doesn't matter that much, which increases the likelihood of being wrong and no ability to undo that wrong. And also, anyone who is out of the norm, born with a disability, or did a wrong, is considered not only valueless, but a negative and should be eliminated. Fascist personalities require hate, loss of it. And harsh punishment is never about rehabilitation. And usually fascists know that. That's why they want to kill everybody. Because if they punish them harshly, they know they'll come back even worse into society. So just kill them. I want to hurt you. And the only way to not have that bite me in the ass is to make sure you never come back. That's the logic. And bite me in the ass can also mean it being revealed that we were all wrong. Statement 16. Homosexuals are hardly better than criminals and ought to be severely punished. Authoritarian aggression and anti-degeneracy. Any sexual behavior that is outside of what you consider quote-unquote normal is a crime and anything abnormal needs to be punished. Even if they aren't harming anyone, it doesn't matter. This is the mean dad approach, and that approach is not about justice or avoiding harm. It's about maintaining the order through punishment. You see this today, this obsession with other people's gender and sex life. And out of your norm automatically means crime. So to really send the message home, homosexuals and trans have always been accused of being pedophiles or rapists. I don't know if it's that they're out of the norm that makes one assume they must be sex criminals, or because they are out of the norm, it makes someone hate them so much that the hate is what makes them want to accuse them of something they haven't even done. But fascists have lots of hate to go around. Hate of anyone not like them, or hate of yourself projected onto others. You see this with closeted homosexuals with fascist tendencies. They hate homosexuals because they're like them. Statement 17. When a person has a problem or worry, it is best for him not to think about it but to keep busy with more cheerful things. anti interception There's a lot of self-help, motivation, and positive thinking with fascist types. Don't think about systematic problems. Don't try to analyze the problem. Think about something else. Power through. Keep the status quo. You're the problem, not the system. Fascists are often great motivational speakers. Like I said, this one trait by itself is not necessarily a bad thing. But if it's this plus a bunch of other things, well, now we have a problem. But also consider this. What is the opposite of self-help? Activism. What do fascists hate? Activism.
Statement 18. Nowadays, more and more people are prying into matters that should remain personal and private. Anti-interception and projectivity. It's the disposition to believe that wild and dangerous things go on in the world. The projection outward of unconscious emotional impulses. So don't think about things. Don't ask. Don't ask people what's going on with them or how they're feeling. We don't need to know. The strong leaders will take care of it. And also, if they're anything like me, they're probably thinking a lot of fucked up things. Statement 19. Some people are born with an urge to jump from high places. Superstition and stereotypy. Stereotypes and superstition go hand in hand. This is how it's meant to be. That's just how people are. Everything is the way it was meant to be. Some people were born to jump off a building. Some people were born to be sad. It's not because they're being made to feel a certain way. But don't ask anyway to find out. Fascists hate investigation and introspection. Statement 20. People can be divided into two distinct classes, the weak and the strong. This is superstition stereotypy and power toughness. But even without explanation, this will stand out to many as a fucked up statement. I mean, it's something a child would come up with, but we're supposed to grow out of this juvenile sort of thinking. And childish ideas in the hands of adults are dangerous. Imagine this being placed into policies where the powerful get all the spoils and the weak are fucked. And that's how it's supposed to be. Wait, you don't have to imagine it. Statement 21. Someday it will probably be shown that astrology can explain a lot of things. Superstition and stereotypy. It's magical thinking, mysticism, and especially it's about it already being predetermined. It's already written in the stars. This is how it's meant to be. And a lot of fascist thinkers think they're just fulfilling their destiny. It's woo-woo and belief without evidence. And at the heart of it is this belief that it is I who is right. And it is the world that is wrong. That's authoritarian and narcissistic. However you cut it, however nice the person tries to make it sound. It's all destiny and I'm the purveyor of truth. And destiny is inevitable. So why try to stop it? Why fight it? How superstition often ties with stereotyping is when you hear someone talking about the samurai spirit just a bit too much. It's racist stereotyping plus superstition. Or when sports fans think doing the tomahawk chop will bring their team good luck. Stereotyping and superstition. Or people who are really into energy systems and alternative medicine, and then the mystical stereotypes and tropes they place on Asians. But stereotypes are almost always based on superstition. It's not based on any science. It's based on feel and what you think is preordained about certain groups. Born to be a certain way by a great creator. Statement 22. Wars and social troubles may someday be ended by an earthquake or flood that will destroy the whole world. It's superstition, stereotypy, and projectivity. I hear this sort of statement all the time. This want to destroy anything that isn't perfect but also projecting your own cynicism and destructive traits onto nature. It's like, if I want to destroy everything, then so must Mother Nature. You want the world to end, but don't speak for the rest of us. But authoritarians love to speak for the rest of us. Even if you still want to go on living, sorry, we all should die anyway. Statement 23. No weakness or difficulty can hold us back if we have enough willpower. Power toughness. This trait is at the heart of all self-help. No institution or systematic oppression can hold you back. It's all on you. You just have to want it bad enough. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If you didn't succeed, win, lose weight, or whatever the goal is, then it's because you didn't want it bad enough. Not because the odds are stacked against you. Never because of that. Statement 24. Western democracies need some institutions that are themselves outside of democratic control to keep order in the chaos that we see today. Power toughness. 
You need strong men in positions of power outside of our control to save us from ourselves. It's an idea I often hear from rich elites, that true democracies aren't worth the trouble. Let us decide things for everyone else. It'll be oppressive, but much more orderly. And you'll often hear this idea. Fascists want you to believe it's unpredictability, not oppression. That's the true evil. Statement 25. Most people don't realize how much our lives are controlled by plots hatched in secret places. Power, toughness, and projectivity. Conspiracy theories are nothing new. It's the currency of fascists. It promotes the rage and hate that is needed for them to survive. Like I said, conspiracies were at the heart of the KKK and Nazis. And even alternative health, self-help, and magical thinking. They all peddle in conspiracies. There are people out there who are trying to stop us, who don't want us to know. It's us versus them. We must attack them to protect ourselves. Statement 26. Human nature being what it is, there will always be war and conflict. Destructiveness and cynicism personality trait. It's the generalized hostility to things not in line with one's personal values and the devaluation of human life and tendencies. It just is the way it is. We're meant to live in an evil world. Might as well give up and change nothing. Don't even bother trying. And what's the matter if people get hurt? That's how it's supposed to be anyway. Why have empathy or compassion? This is a very destructive worldview. Statement 27. Familiarity breeds contempt. Destructiveness and cynicism again. Now, is this being used as a criticism or as an excuse? If the person saying this believes it's natural to hate and that hate is acceptable, then that's a problem. You're making me hate you by being familiar to me. Statement 28. Nowadays, when so many different kinds of people move around and mix together so much, a person has to protect themselves especially carefully against catching an infection or disease from them. Projectivity. It's a hate and mistrust of the unknown. Now add this with the punitive trait, the conspiratorial trait, and many of the other traits, and you got someone who is principled in their hate, which means they have to do things out of principle, not even because they personally got hurt. Statement 29. The wild sex life of the old Greeks and Romans was tame compared to some of the goings-on in this country, even in places where people might least expect it. Again, with these personality types, sex is an obsession. That people are doing weird things, and that's bad. That's criminal. That's evil. Fascist control often starts with controlling sex life. Statement 30. The true American way of life is disappearing so fast that force may be necessary to preserve it. Power toughness. When people say a lot of the dog whistles today are the same things people heard in the past, well, it's true. Like I said, this test was written in the 1940s based on propaganda that was used at the time. This fear of losing tradition, this hate of change, this want to hurt those who challenge your ways, this goes way back. And it also means if you hear the same things today, it's speaking to the same intentions and feelings of the past, those same impulses. So these are 30 ideas and nine traits. Conventionalism, authoritarian submission, authoritarian aggression, anti-interception, superstition stereotypy, power toughness, destructiveness cynicism, projectivity, and anti-degeneracy sex obsession. Now, this list is not perfect, but it's an interesting springboard to think about politics being downstream of personalities. And even if you're not engaging with people politically or consider relationships apolitical, it does not mean it is free of fascist personalities. You might see this in the workplace. You might see this in romantic relationships. And you might even find it in some of your heroes. Now that's the show. If you enjoyed this episode and find this type of independent media worthwhile, please consider supporting the show on Patreon. We have a lot more episodes like this one in the works, but need your financial support to keep the show running. Even a few dollars a month goes a long way. 
No one does what we do, and it's all being funded by you, the listener. In return for supporting us, you'll gain access to lots of bonus content along with our private Discord chat. Even if you can't support us, there's a lot of free bonus content there as well. We also have an online store if you want to show your Southpaw solidarity by wearing our swag. You can find all pertinent links at southpawpod.com. And if you can't afford to support the show and still want to help, please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen. This makes it easier for others to find us. And don't forget to share your favorite episodes or the podcast itself on social media. Tell your friends. Until next time, goodbye. South Paul, hidden with the left. South Paul, Sam, Paul, South Paul, South Paul.